Our text is Psalm 30, Psalm chapter 30 in its totality. And as you turn there, you'll notice the subscript of the psalm is a psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. This was a psalm that David wrote while he was still alive, and yet even when the temple was constructed, this is something that the Lord saw fit to see his people sing to him at the temple dedication. Psalm 30, verses 1 through 12. Hear God's word read. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, and have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Then my glory may sing your praises and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. June 14th, 2014, 1 p.m. I stood on a stage much like this, and as I watched my soon-to-be wife join me, her pastor, David Whitla, preached our wedding sermon. My pastor, James Ferris, he gave us the wedding charge and the wedding vows. And I don't remember anything that either one of them said. But I do remember what my wife and I said to one another. I do remember holding her hands in mine as we exchanged our vows, and as we pledged our loyalty to one another. And as we said to each other, I will be faithful to you in sickness and in health. I remember those vows. As we read this text here, we see David also in a state of sickness, and yet also in a state of prosperity, a state of health. And in verse 4, David says this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to us, to sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. And you are called, in sickness and in health, to worship and to thank the Lord. And as we look at our text, we see, again, David is kind of in two spheres of life, two phases of life. The beginning of the psalm starts with him being on his deathbed. Towards the middle and the end of the psalm, we see him kind of in a state of prosperity, and yet also in a state of great weakness. And the psalm opens with David saying, I will extol you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. And what's the reason that David is saying this? Well, as you continue to read verses 2 and 3, it says, You have not let my foes rejoice over me. And many of the psalms that we read, we hear David say something very similar. You have not let my foes rejoice over me. Yet in those contexts, it is his enemies who are pursuing him. It is his enemies who are seeking his death. And yet as we keep reading, we hear and read David say, You have healed me. You have brought me up from Sheol. So all of David's enemies, all of Israel's enemies, the Philistines and others surrounding the nation, know that the king of Israel is weak know that he's on his deathbed, and they know that as soon as he passes, Israel is vulnerable. And God's enemies can come and easily take over that nation. And yet David says, you have not let my foes rejoice over me, because you've healed me. You've brought up my soul from Sheol. You have restored my life from among those who go down to the pit. And David is very sick. He says, you have brought me up. David cannot even stand. It takes the Lord to bend over and to stoop down and to raise him and to place him on his feet. And many of us can relate with David, can't we? 
Again, we hear this almost ad nauseum, the, the pandemic. Many of us have had to face our own mortality as we see this virus come in from a foreign land. And we see many people die, and we know many people who have died. And we know that if we contract the virus, perhaps we may die. And we're faced with that. Or maybe, maybe you haven't had that fear. But maybe you've had the experience where you've been in the doctor's office. And he comes in and he looks at you and he says, I'm sorry, but the biopsy came back and, and you have cancer. Or maybe you haven't. Maybe you have loved ones, and that's been their experience. And you've had to sit next to them and hold their hand as they see death on the horizon. Or maybe it's not cancer. Maybe it's some other form of sickness. Maybe you've been in the doctor's office and you, you're expecting to hear the heartbeat of your unborn child, and there's none there. And you ask, God, why? Lord, why? And that's David's experience here. And the Lord has promised to heal us. The Lord has promised to heal us from our sicknesses. And don't hear that as a health, wealth, prosperity. If you have enough faith, the Lord will heal you. But the Lord has promised to raise your bodies again if you do die. And the Lord in his providence did not allow David to die, but he did raise him up. He did save him from the grave. And what's David's response? But a response of prayer, a response of thanksgiving, a response of gladness. And he says, anger is for but a moment, but your favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And if you find yourself in a state of weeping right now, know this that joy will come in the morning. And as we progress through this psalm, looking at verse 6, we get an insight into why David is in the state that he is in, why David is on his deathbed. As verse 6 says this, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. You see, before this, David is looking at his kingdom. He's looking at all the things that he's done. And he's saying, this is because of me. This is because of my efforts and my faithfulness. And verse 7 says, it was actually by the favor of the Lord. The Lord's favor is what caused David's mountain to stand strong. And again, this is written in hindsight. So David is able to see his own sin. He's able to see the Lord's faithfulness. He's able to see the, the blessings that he's experienced uh, experiencing come from the Lord. And we don't know this. We were not given the context of what caused David's sickness or what phase of life he is in. But as we read it, I think it's very plausible for us to um, look at David's life and perhaps see where this is coming from. David is at the pinnacle of his power. And you remember towards the end of uh, 2 Samuel, that David says to his commanding officer, he says to Joab, Joab, I want you to go out. I want you to take a census of the land. I want you to count all of our fighting men. I want you to count all of our horses, all the weapons that we have, all of our strength. And Joab says, I don't think that's a good idea, David. But David commands him to do it, and so Joab does. And there are thousands of fighting men and thousands of horses and if you know the story well, you know that what David did was a sin. You know that he was provoked through the temptation of the devil to take this census. And so Gad, the prophet at the time, comes to David. He says, David, you have sinned. You have sinned against God. So you have three options. There can be a famine in the land for three years. You can go on the run again for three months or I can send a plague for three days. Which one do you want? And David thinks about this and he says, I would rather place myself on the mercy of God than on the mercy of men. I've, I've been there, I've run and I've fled and I would rather throw myself at the feet of Yahweh than at the feet of men. And so what does the Lord do? He brings this pestilence across the land and 70,000 people die. 
Now, the text doesn't tell us if David contracted this sickness, contracted this plague, but maybe he did. Or maybe perhaps he had the conscience of 70,000 souls, their deaths on his hand, and this caused him to fall into a state of depression. We don't really know. But what we do know is that he was on his deathbed because of this. Because he says, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. He doesn't pay attention to the fact that the Lord is the one who has preserved him. The Lord is the one who brought him where he is. And we can think of other biblical characters in scripture, can't we? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar almost has a conversion experience in Daniel chapter 3 after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He almost commits himself to Yahweh. And then in chapter 4, he has this dream, and he doesn't know what the dream is about. So he calls Daniel, and Daniel comes, and he interprets the dream for him. And Daniel says, basically, if you don't submit to the Lord, you're going to act like a raving lunatic. And then the chapter ends with Nebuchadnezzar up on his roof, beholding all of Babylon. And he says, look at what I have done. Look what I have created. And the Lord causes him to act like a raving animal, like a crazy lunatic, because he has not acknowledged the blessings of the Lord. And in his pride, he has placed himself on the throne of Yahweh. And the same thing happens to David. And David acknowledging this, seeing his sin, we see his repentance. We see in verse 8, he says, To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? Is the dust going to praise you? Will the mountains sing of your faithfulness? Will the dust praise the Lord? Do the mountains sing and worship Jesus? Well, Jesus says the mountains do display his glory. But you, what's different between a mountain and between you or between David? You have a soul. You're created in the image of God. Your purpose is to worship and to thank the Lord. And David is saying, these things can't do it. Lord, I can. This is what you've created me for. Please let me worship you. I repent of my sin. And what does the Lord do? The Lord heals him. The Lord restores David. And he is able to worship God. But here's the question. Where is David today? His body is dead. His body is dust. So is this psalm for nothing? Was this just a psalm written for David, by David, just at this time? Or does this have lasting significance? Well, this psalm goes beyond David. It transcends who David is and it points to Jesus, the true David. And Jesus, he did come. Jesus did die. But he did rise again. And it's because Jesus has risen again that we are able to say, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. It's because of Jesus that we're able to say, you've turned my morning into dancing. And you've loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. I don't know this congregation well. I don't know what some of the strengths or perhaps some of the weaknesses are. But I do know because we're sinful people, we have indwelling sin in us, that we all do struggle with the sin of pride. So I want you to think. Think in the quietness of your own heart. What's something the Lord has blessed you with? What's some gift that the Lord has given you to advance his kingdom? Think about it. Will you say, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved? Will you say, in my prosperity, as Shawnee Reformed Presbyterian Church, that our candlestick will never be taken away? Or will you say, it is by your hand, Lord, 
that you made my mountain stand strong. It's by your hand, Lord, that you preserve this church. It's by your hand, Lord, that you preserve me as a believer. The book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There's a scene in that book, and of course you know the story, where Dr. Jekyll makes this elixir, this potion, and he drinks it, and it turns him into a raving monster. And eventually, like at first he loves it. He, he loves the power and the strength that he gets. And then he finds out all about the wickedness and the evil things that he does. And so he decides he's not going to do it anymore. And he goes one day without it, two days without it, a month, a year, three years down the road. And there's a scene in the book where he's sitting on a bench and he's recalling his past life, the last few years, and he's thinking, I have beat this. I have overcome Mr. Hyde. I haven't taken this elixir. I haven't done anything wicked. And then he gets a chill down the back of his spine. And he looks down at his hands. And he realizes he's turned into Mr. Hyde. And this is what our pride does. You think about the gifts that God has given you. Perhaps God's given you the gift of encouragement. Perhaps you're like a Barnabas. Are you able to encourage the saints? And you think to yourself, I'm the best encourager there is. You look at the person next to you, I'm a way better encourager than you are. What, is, what have you done? Your pride has overcome you. And in the very gifts, the very blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon you has turned into sin and has turned into wickedness. Is David dead? Yes. But what are the benefits in death that the believer receives? The benefits in death that the believer receives is that they, they are united with Christ. And it is because of Christ, again, that we can say joy comes in the morning. And you, too, are united with Christ. And you, too, must acknowledge how the Lord has blessed you and how he's made your mountain stand strong. And if you'll, you'll pardon me for um, ending a little bit early, I do want to end with this. Who are you as Christians? Who are you as the church? You're the bride of Christ. And what are your wedding vows as the bride of Christ? Your wedding vows are to worship the Lord and to thank the Lord in sickness and in health. And as you find yourself without a teaching elder, without a pastor, know this, that it is the Lord who makes your mountain stand strong. And that is, it is Jesus who is your over-shepherd. And he uses the elders here, the under-shepherd, to shepherd you. So do not despair. But notice how he has strengthened you. How he has blessed you. How he has made your mountain to stand strong and worship him, and thank him, whether you have a ruling elder or a teaching elder or not. Worship the Lord in sickness and in health. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that weeping tarries in the night and that joy does come in the morning. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who makes our mountain stand strong. Lord, we thank you that you have taken our sackcloth and you have clothed us with gladness. Lord, we thank you that you have promised to redeem us. You have promised to heal us. Lord, we thank you that you have overcome sickness, that you have overcome death. Lord, we thank you that you are ruling and that you are reigning. And Lord, we do pray that whatever state of life we find ourselves in, that we will not despair, that we will not grow in pride, Lord, but we will thank you, that we will worship you, that we will praise you. Lord, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.